Hello, teddy bear. <laughs> I guess it's teddy bear. And uh, I also have something on the shrine. You can see it next to the flowers. There's the flowers on the one side of the Buddha and the flower on the other side. That's a cauliflower. So our guests today, who were on the Zoom yesterday, and they manifested in real life today, they brought cauliflower for Ajahn Brahm because he's not allergic to cauliflower. <laughs> That's his present, soaking up the meta for his lunch tomorrow. <laughs> anyway, silliness aside, and teddy bears welcome, including cats. They're not teddy bears, they're just real life floppers. <laughs> I love Marion's cat. It's like it just fits on your neck and around your neck and on your shoulder and everywhere. It fits. Amazing. The one with your cat. Oh. Anyway, nice to see. And it's nice to see all of you. So it's the last Sutta class today, but fear not, because there will be another retreat, hopefully in May, hopefully with Ajahn Brahmali. And uh, at that time, he can continue where I leave off. <laughs> Let's see. I'm sure we could go through this whole thing again and again, and we wouldn't tire. And different parts would stand out to you at different times. But we thought we'd spare you. I thought I would spare you for more unright view because I think we've covered a lot of that already in the uh, for first three noble truths, which are all part of right view. You know, right view constitutes the four noble truths, karma and rebirth, at least a provisional understanding. And uh, they're the main things, really, as uh, the preliminary right view of a non-stream winner. And then that, of course, gets firmed up later on with the first uh, stage of enlightenment, when that view becomes an experience and changes the view forever. So you can no longer view the world in terms of a self, in terms of permanence, or in terms of any kind of persisting, lasting happiness in the sensual world. So, but until we reach that, stage it's very helpful to have a kind of framework and um, the Buddha said that two things are needed for stream winning one is the uh, wise attention that goes to the source so yoni so manasikara and the other is the word of another which really means the word of somebody who has attained that stage at least of enlightenment an Arya Pugala a noble person and of course this is what we're gaining here we're learning to use our own attention in ways that look inside and look to the cause of what is arising so that we can understand how the wholesome states arise and increase how the unwholesome states lessen and how we can prevent them entering in in the first place when we use our mind in wise wholesome ways and uh, also we are being conditioned by the buddha's so this is the word of another and the best word of all is, of course, of the Buddha and of people who've practiced well. But however far we might have gone on the path, when we practice, these teachings tend to come alive for us. And it's an ongoing process. The more we practice, the more we understand. The more we understand, the further it can help deepen the practice. So these two factors are there for all of us, which means that we are, we have everything it takes to enter the stream. So today, as I said, I'm skipping over the right view, which is many, many pages long. So we're now on page 33, if for anyone who wants to follow using the, um, the document that we sent to you. So we're going to start with right motivation. And this is Ajahn Brown's translation of what is often called right attitude, even right thought, but that is a little bit too far away from the meaning because it doesn't have to be a verbal thought. Um, and certainly in meditation, thinking does subside. So, but we still have motivation. We still have intention, inclination, attitudes in our mind. So the reason that he translated it as motivation rather than intention, which was my uh, preferred favorite in the past, is something to do with law. And I can't verify this, but this is his um, explanation that intention is about where you're going, like what you want to affect. Um, so I intend to finish such as such, or I intend to behave kindly towards someone, whereas motivation is where you're coming from. So it's slightly further back in the chain of causality, one could say. So we start right at where we begin. <laughs> what now is right motivation? So this is from the Dikini Kaya number 22. Actions of body 
speech and mind arising from a motive of renunciation, arising from a motive of kindness, avyapada, or arising from a motive of gentleness, avihimsaka. This is called right motivation. So straight away, I find that quite interesting because it doesn't say actions of body, speech, and mind are motivated by renunciation, etc. But it says arising from a motive of renunciation. So how is it arising in the first place? And the answer for that is that the motivation is coming from that right view. So we've already discussed right view in detail, and that's, of course, the first factor of the path. And there are other suttas in the Pali Canon, like the Mahachattarisaka Sutta, something like that. I always find it hard to say. I think it's mm, otherwise called the Mahachattarisaka. It's somewhere towards the end of the Majjhima Nikaya, something like 140, somewhere there. And in there, it very clearly states that the Eightfold Pass is, is a kind of sequential process. So each factor feeds into the next. But that doesn't mean it's linear. It can also feedback on itself and it can also be holographic so that each factor includes the rest but generally speaking you know it, there's also a sequential process so these right motives uh, actually arise from right view in other words they're conditioned too somebody asked in the question time recently like is is the uh, is kindness the doing you know do we do something to be kind and you could say yes but you could also say that um we've been conditioned to be kind you know by hearing the teachings especially those teachings on suffering um there's no other choice but to be kind you know it doesn't make sense to be cruel when we understand that there's already so much suffering so much harm so much cruelty in the world so then what are the wrong motivations they are motivations of desire concerning the world of the five senses of aversion and of cruelty. So these are the exact opposites of the right motivations. Desire concerning the world of the five senses is the opposite of nekama, let go or renunciation. So we're not talking about renouncing the bliss of meditation, the bliss of um, joy, gratitude, generosity, etc. These are good things to cultivate. But we are talking about renouncing the desire concerning the five senses, which only leads to increasing our greed and in a way frustration as well, because you know, we're never going to actually get quenched that way. We're never really going to find the satisfaction, the direct opposite of loving kindness and of cruelty, the direct opposite of gentleness, or you could translate that as well as compassion. What is the source of these wrong motivations? They arise from perceptions of desire concerning the world of the five senses, perceptions of aversion and perceptions of cruelty. Where do these wrong motivations cease without remainder? They cease in the first jhana. So that's quite interesting <laughs> that there's a place that they cease and that's in the first jhana. It's impossible, of course, to have... Um, any of these wrong motivations at that point because the mind is just so incredibly pure and there's very little movement left there's still a little bit of movement just enough to go on to the object because in the first jhana it's not a hundred percent sometimes falls back from the pt again and then gets pulled in again um but those motivations are motivations of kindness renunciation and gentleness so it's entirely for your own good and um here also it's interesting because it's not saying that they arise from a motive anymore, but it's saying they arise from perceptions of desire, aversion, cruelty. But again, those perceptions are a result of view. So from view, we perceive according to our view. And that perception tends to lead to thoughts. So our whole world is created by view and then perception. Perception conditions the thought. So what are the right motivations? They are motivations of renunciation, kindness, and gentleness. What is the source of these right motivations? They arise from perceptions of renunciation, kindness, and gentleness. And so the more we actually train perception to perceive things 
in terms of kindness, for example, looking at people's goodness, looking at the way people suffer or maybe suffering that we don't know about, um, the more that we can actually respond and incline or be disposed to those people with gentleness, kindness and non-control, we could say, yeah? in relation to others, the renunciation may be manifesting as sort of a non-control, a non-possession, not trying to fix people, not trying to uh, change people according to our own desires. Yeah, We're letting go of those five sense pleasures. So, you know, people People can be the way they are. We don't look to them to fulfill our unmet needs so much when we start to find that happiness inside. So where do these right motivations cease without remainder? They cease in the second jhana. <laughs> so this is as the process of practice goes deeper and as the will actually fades away and then stops in that second jhana. There's no movement at all there. So motivation's done its job for now. It's got you that far. And now the mind is completely still. So the second jhana is defined as the bliss of samadhi. Um, it's like rock solid stillness, which Ajahn Brown says is only, yeah, you can call the first jhana stillness. And even anything preceding that, I'm sure you've all experienced some stillness during this retreat to some extent. But the stillness of the second jhana is absolute. And that's the section on right motivation. So that was quite um, quick. But I think just to draw this out a little bit more before I open perhaps for some questions, I thought it was lovely when Ajahn Brahm was teaching the metta meditation and talking about metta to the past and the future as well. And it made me think his motivations you know, our disposition, let's say towards uh, our whole life not only towards others towards our interactions but this disposition this, this motive of renunciation kindness and gentleness can also pertain to the past the way we regard the past the way we regard the future you know sometimes people say that the future you know depression is about looking at the future with a fault-finding mind you know with with cruelty or with fear um, anxiety as well. We're looking at the future in the kind of worst case scenario rather than with that gentleness, that kind of openness of heart that maybe allows something beautiful to happen. We don't know. So these right motivations can be dispositions that we use towards everything in our lives. You know, giving ourselves the benefit of doubt, giving up life the benefit of the doubt. Um, and trusting in our karma, because really this motivation is very close to karma, right? It's where we're coming from. So if we continue planting good seeds of kindness, compassion, gentleness, letting go, non-control, non-ownership, non-clinging, then that's bound to result in happiness outside. It's not always immediate, of course, but this is where the trust is important and the continuous um, commitment to that path. So are there any questions about this part of the sutta so far? Okay, I'm seeing a question or two. Wow, this is a long question. <laughs> Thank you, Arjun Brahman, Venerable Chanda, for your guidance and love. I've been hearing your talk since many years, probably Arjun Brahman in particular, because I'm a little newer, but not that new. They have a great impact on my whole life. Since a long time, I'm working with children who cannot learn to read and write in school and give them special training. Yes, I do. Really good livelihood. For this work, your teachings are a most precious guidance every day. Children with dyslexia, autism, Down syndrome, ADHD and others have developed in a wonderful and individual way their reading and writing skills. Isn't that great? I love the um, description, wonderful and in individual way, because we're all so different and different in a beautiful way, in a way that can enrich the world. Teachers, parents and other institutions are happy and thankful that there is development possible where they thought it's not possible. Exactly, because all of us can develop beautiful motivations, right? All of us can be kind, we can be gentle. These aren't qualities of the brain, these are qualities of the heart. 
And, you know, sometimes our mind, our intellect, our brain power can actually go in the opposite direction. And it can be very dangerous if somebody's super clever, you know, but they're actually cruel. The two in combination, you know, they produce people like Putin, is it, or Putin, however you say, you know, is dangerous, right? Because we can use our brains to justify almost anything. And if it's not coming from the right place, then we're in trouble. The children are deeply relieved that they're not stupid, wonderful, and proud that they're able to learn these abilities. All this wouldn't be possible without having met your teachings, even though I have another bigger aim. I wanted very much to let you know this, your friend. Thank you. I won't say your name, <laughs> but we know you. And yes, I have also read your email. So, um, yes, and it's important to remember you're hearing these teachings through Ajahn Brahm and to some extent through me, but really these are the Buddha's teachings and that's why they work. You know, they're universal timeless teachings that are applicable. Yeah, this is one of the qualities of the Dhamma, Swakato, it's clearly explained, but what oh, is that? Yeah, Bhagavato, Dhammo, Sanditiko, like uh, it's experienceable now, Akaliko, timeless. So they never wear out, you know, and sometimes it might take a little bit of digging into those sort of to get sort of uh, maybe put your own language to some of these terms, because sometimes it can seem a bit dated or archaic. But actually, when you look at the message, it applies to the human mind. And that's always going to be the case, even if I don't know what happens if we get artificial intelligence. But <laughs> but as long as we're human sentient beings, then our minds are going to have that capacity. And that's the beauty of the human realm. OK, about the motivation of renunciation. What do you think about a lay person following as many Vinaya rules as they can, maybe even beyond the eight precepts? I know of some people who've shaven their heads and I myself have done that in the past as an act of renouncing physical beauty. Yeah, I mean, shaving the head is not a Vinaya rule as such. I mean, of course, there are rules around how long our hair can be, and we can apparently have a couple of inches, which I never realised until I lost my uh, razor blade for a while. <laughs> it was quite long. And I said to Ajahn, oh, it's a bit long, isn't it? It was like, I don't know, not very big. And he said, you can have two inches. But I think it's great. It's very freeing to do that. And I did that before my first long course. I sat a 30 day course, 1998 or something. And I shaved all my beautiful long hair that I used to swing around at rock gigs. <laughs> and it was wonderful. It was incredibly freeing. And I caused quite a stir in the little Indian town I was in. You know, I had a whole crowd of people around the barbers, like staring at me. And the barber had this big blade on my head. And he was going, it's a woman, it's a woman. And everyone, oh. <laughs> but it was great. Yeah, it's um, it's very freeing, I would say. So you could try that. About other Vinaya rules, it could get a little bit tricky, and I'm not sure how uh, appropriate or relevant it might feel. I mean, of course, there's some, maybe the training rules that you could try, like not slurping your food and like chewing mindfully and not licking your fingers, things like that. But if you're going to try start, doing things like not handling money, then that's going to be very difficult and probably not advisable either because a renunciate is someone who's actually taken the precepts formally and is in training and wearing the robes, people understand what that means. It means you're a samana, it means you're celibate, etc. And it's only the celibate samana that has the right, in a sense, who's not working, to go on arms, for example, to receive food from the laity. So things like this are very specific to the monastic sangha, and I think it's important it stays like that. But of course, simple. Simplifying, simplifying, simplifying is the Buddha's path. And in any of the suttas on the gradual training, simplification, living a simple life is actually part of virtue. So we talk about the five precepts, we talk about their opposites, not only abstaining from killing, but actually acting with compassion and tenderness to all living beings, not only abstaining from stealing, but being generous, being kind, giving away. And after the five precepts, we talk about sense restraint. So, you know, again, looking at things in ways that actually brings more harmony for yourself and others. And after this, the simplicity, also uh, having moderate sleep, eating moderately, things like this, I think can be very helpful. But yeah, I wouldn't get too technical with it because one thing is it's completely impractical. And the other thing is that it might be 
a little bit too demanding on those people around you as well. So, and also not to mention that as well, because that could cause a bit of confusion. You know, if you say I'm trying to follow the uh, monastic Vinaya, <laughs> then it could be quite confusing. People won't know if you're a monastic or not. But uh, certainly I think your intention here is very good. And if it helps you to simplify and find more sense restraint, that's wonderful. Okay, can you say something about the link between right view and the three right motivations? I can say something. <laughs> I won't say too much because I would like to get on. But um, for me, I guess personally, if I look at my life, and maybe you can look at yours as well, um, it's that understanding of suffering that really gives rise to compassion in my heart. And that kind of compassion seems to be a very natural outcome of having contacted my own suffering and having my eyes open. It helps actually when you contact your own suffering to be able to open your eyes to the suffering in the world. Because when you're able to stay present with your own um, so-called afflictive emotions, sadness or grief or despair and really embrace it and have a look at it, rather than push it away, you realize, wow, okay, this is a universal thing. You know, for example, you go through something in your life you've not been through before, maybe you're in an abusive relationship. And until that happened to you, you might have thought, oh, I don't really know why people kind of don't leave those sorts of relationships. I don't know, are they just not strong enough? Maybe they weren't very smart. But when it happens to you, then you realize why, <laughs> you know, you realize just how difficult, how um, confusing, how you want to keep giving these people a chance, you know, how you get trapped into being the sort of savior or whatever it might be and how these things can happen. And then it gives you a lot more uh, compassion and kindness and understanding of others who've been in a similar situation. So it becomes natural then that rather than judgment, compassion would arise, you know, um, even rather than maybe you don't outwardly judge, but you just don't really understand. So instead of that lack of understanding and that maybe disconnect, a connection and an understanding can arise towards the other. And that helps to feed the compassion. I often feel that empathy is an indispensable part of compassion. It's not necessarily compassion on its own. Because compassion, according to the Buddha's teaching, is this um, motivation to, um, to see the other person come out of suffering. And that's why it can be a Brahma Vihara, a divine abode. It's actually a very beautiful wish, and it's a wish that brings happiness in one's heart. You know, may you be free from suffering. Not just may I understand and resonate with your suffering, but may you be free, and you imagine that person free. So understanding suffering is incredibly helpful for the compassion. And of course, the same with the other motives, right? I mean, if you understand the suffering of the five sense world, it's easier to renounce it. It's easier to let it go. If you understand a little bit about non-self, that's part of right view. Again, it's easier to let this five sense world go because it's not your world. You can't control it. You don't have to spend so much time thinking about it or putting things together in a way that's just right for you. You know, you can be a little bit more open to what happens. I mean, I know for myself, when I started practicing, I renounced a lot. I mean, I'd left home. I was in India at the age of 19, and I was really keen on the practice from the first retreat. So I would serve and serve and serve. And then I realized there was a kind of a circle of people that you'd meet in different meditation centers, depending where you traveled. And uh, at the hot season, they'd all go to the Himalayas. In the cold season, you'd all go down to like the plains, you know, <laughs> to Jaipur or to Bombay or wherever. And I realized, oh, there's a lot of pleasure in this. And it's a good pleasure, but it's also, there's still a lot of choice, a lot of control in a sense. Like at the end of a retreat, everyone would want to get the best papaya or the best chai wala best chai stall in this in the village <laughs> and you know you would indulge your senses a little bit in that way and it just started to feel to me that I wanted to challenge myself a bit better because my life was incredibly happy and fulfilling and not that much suffering was coming up so I felt like yeah maybe I should like just challenge myself a bit more by renouncing that sort of control and um, I wanted to ordain you know from the very beginning actually of my practice um so finally after 10 years when I found a monastery um it was 
a little challenging at first to be in one place and to think that this is it forever because that was my intention um but after a while it was very freeing you know and I had to face things like the heat <laughs> like the food I didn't like like uh uh well actually it was I mean it was just incredible I can't really complain I mean there were physical difficulties but we had the most incredible teacher who would meditate with us around the clock and teachings every day and all the conditions to live a very rich practice life so um I don't know why I started talking about that but just uh yeah seeing the like lack of satisfaction in the five senses led to that renunciation and led to less control over it as well I think that's where I was coming from there and then of course the gentleness right we realize beings are fragile and beings are deluded right we do have wrong views, so that's suffering in and of itself. So we have to be gentle with ourselves, with others. So hopefully that will be a natural outcome of right view as it develops more and more. And for one with really right view as an area, I mean, the defilements are also getting worn away. So when the defilements are worn away, then of course what's left is loving kindness, right? Ill will gets worn away, then the opposite is loving kindness. It's just you're freed up for that. That's the only thing. For an arahat that motivates them anymore. <laughs> the Brahma Viharas, they just exist to serve. Okay, could you explain how gentleness is different from kindness? I thought gentleness referred to the form of kindness. Sorry, gentleness referred to the form and kindness to the content. Any examples? Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought of it like that, so I'm not. 100% sure what you mean but um in my meditation I asked this question too and I realized that kindness was more like um a kind of uh way of regarding the object so like a kind of sense of warmth a kind of relation to the object and gentleness for me anyway in the meditation is more like how I hold that object like how close I am to it, if that makes sense. So it's not so much like how I'm infusing it, like the kindness is the warmth, it's the respect, it's the giving things space, like really embracing things. And the gentleness is more like how close or how tight, I mean, it's the opposite of tight, um, how much, yeah, how, um, how I'm holding the object. Does that make sense? It's slightly different. I often experiment with gentleness because I also think of it as the opposite of impatience. I think impatience is a kind of lack of gentleness and it, patience is not my best quality. <laughs> Kindness is quite strong. Patience is not as strong. And so I practice a lot with gentleness to see just how gentle my mind can be. And it's a little bit like letting go, you know, just see how much you can disappear, like how incredibly light can be the touch, so to speak, of the mind with the object. Like it can be incredibly light. You know, at first when we start to practice, we might kind of really want to get close to the breath and hold the breath and tighten up around it. The gentleness is the opposite. It's like opening the hand and being so almost like invisible to the object. Like you're so gentle, you're just like a mist. So it's a way, I think, of handling what comes up. Does that make sense? That's one example um gentleness and kindness yeah so again kindness i'm quite good at being kind performing acts of kindness gentleness might involve being a little um, more giving things space being less imposing kindness can sometimes be too active like i want to be kind and then you're like over kind you know it can be even overbearing but gentleness is more maybe it's more related to humility as well I mean experiment for yourself I love to take these words and just really play with them and like ask myself what it what it is and look at how I can use it in my daily life okay what's the Pali word for gentleness thanks um in this case it's not gentleness is one translation but here it's avihimsaka which means non-violence non-cruelty um so the opposite of non-violence non-cruelty could be seen as gentleness but it could also be seen as um compassion yeah 
So they're quite related too. Maybe it's like because of the suffering element, you have to be gentler, like not touch things too closely. I don't know if that makes sense. But there's another Pali word, mudu, which means soft. And I think of that word as very similar to gentleness as well. Because again, the attention, you know, you can be kind to something, give it warmth, etc. But how soft are you? How gentle are you? It's a bit similar, perhaps. Okay, thank you. I love this subject. <laughs> but I will now see if we can get into right speech. Also very related and noticing here that it's coming after right motivation. So seeing that causal link, seeing how if you're motivated with kindness, gentleness, or compassion, and that non-possession, that letting go, it would naturally motivate your speech. And the words that come out are much more likely to be wholesome, to be kind, to be gentle, encouraging, yeah? and harmonious as well. So here we go. This Digger Nikai number 22 again. I have to reread this because it's obviously a wonderful sutta that includes all of this. What now is right speech? Right speech is refraining from lying, from malicious gossip, from harsh speech, and from useless chatter. So it's not just not lying, but also malicious speech, harsh speech, and useless chatter, sometimes translated as gossip. And the people that come to my Zoom know how I remember this. Usually I have this little acronym, For My Higher Good, F-M-H-G. <laughs> so uh, F is for false, M is for malicious, H is for harsh, and G is for gossip. For My Higher Good. So anyway, that helps me to remember them because I think speech is such a rich source for practice and also a rich and dangerous place for us to make mistakes. Um, you know, most people, it's a matter of you either drink or you don't drink. You either take intoxicants or you don't, right? You either commit adultery or you don't. Hopefully you never do. But if you do, it's a single act, hopefully, <laughs> only. Um, but speech is something we have to do every day in so many different contexts. And so there's enormous power for healing, for bringing peace and harmony into the world, and enormous power for the opposite as well. <clears throat> so we're going to go through each one, one by one. And the first one is abstaining from lying. You abandon lying and abstain from false speech. If you're asked to tell what you know, then you tell only what you know as accurately as you can. So you do not intentionally speak a lie or deceive for your own benefit or for the sake of another or for some other reason. So we don't even lie for people's benefit. Is that difficult? Is that hard? <laughs> it would have to go hand in hand with other things if you are going to tell the truth, because later on we'll see that it's not only being truthful, but we have to make sure we have a mind of meta and we say things gently and for people's benefit as well, not only just tell the raw truth at any cost. But I like this part. If you're asked to tell what you know, then you tell only what you know. You don't fabricate, you don't tell other stuff that's not relevant to what you're being asked. Yeah, you don't tell things you don't know. You know, I'm not sure, but it seems like that person must have also done this and this and this if they did this. <laughs> that's uh, actually not direct experience. So it might be, yeah, unfair to the other and a misrepresentation of the truth. And then the next part is from the Vinaya. So this is the code of discipline, or, or let's say code of, I prefer to call them rules, uh, training in restraint, Vinaya. Actually, that's quite a good translation. The trainings in restraint. To be a deliberate lie, you must be mindful before speaking. I am going to speak falsely whilst being aware that I am telling a lie. And afterwards, be aware that I have misrepresented the truth. So the reason this is in the Vinaya is that all these three things have to be present for it to constitute a lie. And of course, when we have our patimokas, our recitation of the training rules, 
um, we have to tell the other members of the Sangha if we've done something wrong. So then they will try to find out, is it really a lie? And they'll use this criteria to find out. So if it is a lie, then there will be a, um, a kind of process to follow to make repairs. So it's not like you get beaten or you get chucked out, but um, unless it's a, a, the breakage of something that leads to disrobal, there are a few offences like that if you tell a really terrible lie or some other terrible misconduct like sexual, um, anything sexual, basically, um, for a celibate monastic. So, well, sexual intercourse, yeah, there's a few other things that are not actually um, disrobing offences, but they're all fairly serious. Uh, so the idea is that you are honest and you try to make amends. Okay, so that's the lying. And the next one is abstaining from malicious gossip. You abandon malicious gossip and abstain from talk that causes division. Having heard something, you do not repeat it in order to divide people from one another. Instead, you're one who reunites those who are divided, a promoter of unity, who enjoys, rejoices and delights in concord, a speaker of words that promote concord. I find that very lovely. And again, shows the power of words. Okay, abstaining from harsh speech. Having abandoned harsh speech, you abstain from coarse speech. This is quite hard to, to say, actually, harsh speech. Anyway, <laughs> you only speak words that are gentle, pleasing to the ear and lovable. Words that go to the heart are courteous, desired by many and agreeable to many. That's nice as well, isn't it? Lovable and go to the heart desired by many and agreeable to many. So there's something universal about this. And then Ajahn, I think, or the original of this little booklet has thrown in the simile of the saw. So this is, uh, this is quite a challenging one. Even if terrorists were to torture you, such as by savagely cutting off your head with a sharp serrated knife, and that's Ajahn Brown's modernization. If you allowed hatred to develop in your mind towards them, then you would not be carrying out my teaching. Instead, you should train yourself thus. My mind will remain unaffected and I shall speak no bad words. I shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. I shall start pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness and, starting with them, I shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. This is how you should train. So just to say here that this does not mean that we look for such situations <laughs> and we suffer them because it's good practice to just suffer it and no we're very kind and gentle and hopefully if we're moral people hopefully we won't be in such situations or we'll be less likely to be in such situations but here the word that's emphasized to me anyway that jumps out to me today is to train ourselves and I think this is also important to train yourself before this happens. <laughs> because I don't know about you, but I'm probably not ready for this to happen. So we have to train ourselves now. My mind will remain unaffected. I shall speak no bad words. So the restraint of speech is maybe one of the easier parts of this. I shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness and without inner hate. And furthermore, we're actually going to pervade them with loving kindness, spreading from them to the whole world. So we have to start now practicing loving kindness towards those beings who are easy to generate loving kindness towards and gradually perhaps start including some people that we find difficult, maybe even situations that we find difficult, parts of ourselves that we're not at peace with. And gradually our heart can expand in this way. 
So the Buddha's saying, you won't be carrying out my teaching if you have a mind of hate. So he's really saying there's no justification for that or that and that. It's never helpful at all to develop hate because it's only going to bring about suffering for you in the future and in the moment as well, right? You know how it feels when you have hate or dislike towards someone. It's like a massive obstacle. You know, it really is a blockage to your happiness. And with this practice of loving kindness, particularly when we can do it in sequence, you know, starting with the easier people and gradually practicing towards those who are difficult as well, that any sort of uh, lingering resentments tend to get dissolved. And after a while, when you do have a lot of loving kindness, if something comes up in your life that causes you irritation or resentment, you can immediately attend to it so that it doesn't take hold. So, and then the last one on uh, of the four, so useless chatter or gossip. Having abandoned useless chatter, you abstain from unbeneficial talk. You speak at a proper time, speak truth, speak what is beneficial, speak on the Dhamma and the discipline. At a proper time, you speak words that are worth recording, reasonable, succinct, and beneficial. Okay, that's my little hint to keep going and be succinct. <laughs> so, but I like this one because it's talking about respect, really, isn't it? Respect for the other person. You know, you find out if it's the right time, not just for you, but for them. Speak the truth, what is beneficial. Speak on the Dhamma and the discipline. Isn't that lovely to talk about Dhamma? I love to talk about Dhamma. So I should be succinct because otherwise we won't get through this part of the sutta. And the next part is very helpful. I'll, I'll read through the next part and then we'll have some questions. I won't go on to the other right action and right livelihood because that's quite straightforward. You can read that for yourselves. Um, <clears throat> but this is really, really helpful, I think, especially for daily life, because sometimes we think that it's good for us to tell other people how they should be or to tell people off and point out their faults, etc. And the Buddha has some very, very interesting criteria and safeguards against us doing that so if you read this list you might find that uh, it actually points you to looking at yourself so the right way to criticize somebody but no reference here so it might be the same reference number 21 i'm not sure or it might be that the reference has been forgotten here you'll have to look in sutras to find out before you criticize someone, he should be mindful with respect to five things and carefully establish five things. So some of you have been in my sutta classes and uh, we talked about five things being right time, uh, right time with metta, with gentleness, beneficial and truthful. That's how the speech should be. But this is five different things. Some of them overlap, but this is five things to do before you criticize someone. So we ask, is my bodily behavior blameless? Do I possess bodily behavior that is pure, flawless, and irreproachable? Does this quality exist in me or not? <laughs> if your bodily behavior is not beyond blame, there will be those who say of you, please train your own bodily behavior first. <laughs> so that's well that's tough isn't it so is it only like enlightened people can really criticize others but then enlightened people never criticize others so <laughs> so anyway this is a uh, something for you to explore <laughs> number two is my behavior of speech blameless do i possess behavior of speech that is pure flawless and irreproachable does this quality exist in me or not? If your behavior of speech is not beyond blame, there will be those who say of you, please train your own speech first. <laughs> but don't anyone, because it's good to like listen as well. <laughs> okay. Number three, have I established a mind of loving kindness without resentment to my associates? Does this quality exist in me or not? 
If you have not established a mind of loving kindness without resentment to your associates, there will be those who say of you, please establish a mind of loving kindness without resentment to your associates first. So that's very easy to understand, I think, because we all know the results of not doing that first, and it usually blows up enormously. Whereas when you wait a while and develop loving kindness or have a good sleep and you approach things, you approach them a totally different way. And of course, then the person doesn't get defensive and, you know, shout back. Number four, am I learned, learned? And do I remember and understand correctly what I've learned? Have I learned about those teachings on Dhamma that are good in the beginning, good in the middle and good in the end? That's all of them, hopefully, which proclaim the perfectly complete and pure spiritual life. Have I remembered them accurately, investigated them thoroughly and understood them properly? Does this quality exist in me or not? So there we go. And I'm a bit confused as to why there were only four when it said five. But... I only have four. So I don't know. Does anyone else have a fifth one? <laughs> Maybe it's a mistake in the text. Anyone else? No. You have five? So what's the next one? I don't have it. Oh, I found it. Okay. <laughs> if not, there will be those of you who say, please learn your own tradition first. Okay. So it's actually 10 now. <laughs> it's multiplied. All right, number five. Have both monastic codes been well learned and understood by me? And this really applies to the monastics. I think most of them do, but most of them are applicable to us all. This one, you're probably not going to learn both codes. Does this quality exist in me or not? If not, there will be others who say of you, please learn the monastic rules first. Number six, you resolve to speak at an appropriate time, not an improper time. Okay, so this is the one I mentioned in the beginning. This, I think, is a different one found separately in other parts of the sutras, but here it seems to be added on. So you resolve to speak at an appropriate time, not an improper time. You resolve to speak truthfully, not falsely, gently, not harshly, in a beneficial way, not in a way that causes harm. And you resolve to speak with a mind of loving kindness while not harboring ill will. Wonderful. Hmm. Okay. So we're now almost done, but I'm sure there might be some questions or some comments. Or please feel free also, you don't have to ask, like as if I know and you don't know. You're also welcome to share any insight that you might have. So. Okay, how to deal with situations when telling on truths may potentially be acting as a protective factor, e.g. as a single woman telling she has a partner or living alone in order to avoid potentially risky or dangerous situations. It never felt good to tell on truths, yet this has saved me from harassment, unwelcome and unhealthy attention and other risky situations. Very good question. and. Um, I think it's kind of dangerous teaching to say, yes, that's okay. So what I would probably say instead is that you have to use it carefully. You know, there may be situations that really do, um, where it might seem helpful and more helpful than unhelpful to bend the truth in this way, to protect yourself. And this is really important if there really is a physical threat. Um, but, there might be other ways to do it, and ideally you would choose those. Uh, for example, I probably shouldn't say this live, but some of the time I live alone too. And um, instead of flagging that all over the website and put my address, I don't put my address. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just say, please be aware this is a monastic residence rather than a bikuni residence, one bikuni. Because often, of course, there are other people here. Um, yeah, actually telling you have a partner when you don't, it's tricky, isn't it? Because I would consider that a lie. 
<laughs> so I don't know if you can avoid being in such a situation where you have to say anything at all. Um, I would say use this only as an emergency if you really have to, but be creative and see if you can think of a better way. I mean, it is really difficult for women, and I'm not at all suggesting that we should ever put ourselves in a danger at all, because I think, you know, it's not our fault that we might be at risk. It's actually, it's really interesting that the word men is never used, and I'm sorry to any men here, but often we say people may, you know, people may uh, rape us or something like this, but it's really um, men. And... Uh, you know, it's for everybody to look at their conduct as well. It's for the whole community to work together on this, I think. You know, like how can most men who are good men help to protect women as well, you know, and get some good allies there for yourself? Because it's always a minority of people who create such horrible um, abuse and, and risk and danger for others. So, yeah. Maybe try and do something more to protect yourself if you possibly can. I don't know if that was a very good answer, but it's one of those ambiguous things. You have to use your discernment. I say use it carefully and use it rarely if you have to bend the truth. Dear Venerable Chanda, I just wonder how the right speech can be fully followed by lay people. Why lay people? I imagine I would have to sit quietly on business and family meetings as they're not dumb. At, ah, okay. And usually useless chatter. Any advice? Yeah. I mean, that particular list was specifically for monastics and it was just shared because most of it relates to all of us. So even monastics don't only talk about dhamma. But in a sense, you can align everything you do with the dhamma. Even if you're not speaking directly about the Buddha's teachings, you can still try to approach family and business meetings with an attitude of dhamma, right? How can we approach this meeting in a way that's kind, that's gentle, that brings about benefit for everybody, that creates harmony amongst the family, amongst in the business? You know, maybe it does have to be also be profitable because you have to feed yourself, you have to, you know, pay your bills. And then there's nothing wrong with that. But then if you are well off, for example, your business is doing well, you can think about sharing that wealth and looking after your friends and family, maybe making donations to charitable causes, wherever you feel that the suffering that you can help to alleviate. So it's not about sitting quietly, but it's about using speech wisely and carefully and with discernment. And perhaps, at least for me, I know I could often say a little bit less, you know, we can often... Um, be more concise and to the point and sometimes that actually helps others to listen to us more so don't take that too literally obviously you're not going to restrain yourself to the point of not being able to function in the world you have to function in the world but if you have very clearly in mind that your whole life is a practice of the eightfold path or can be uh inclined or can be um aligned with the eightfold path then that brings a lot more meaning to everything you do and you can practice mindfulness in every situation right so when you do find your speech going off course and as i say speech is very difficult so it's a constant practice you can be mindful and pause so you don't have to sit quietly but you can sit in a way that's non-confrontational maybe you can sit in a way that um you know where you speak at the right time you don't interrupt other people. Um, you can monitor your responses. And if you find you're getting angry or the, the conversation is escalating, you can pause. You can even close your eyes for a minute and people will realize that you're just resting. They won't know you're meditating. <laughs> and, uh, and that might help to bring some composure to the situation. I hope that helps. But yeah, the useless chatter is when you know that you're with people and you're just kind of going along with the conversation, even though it's going to completely downhill and everybody's getting tired and it's getting more and more kind of a waste of time. Sometimes we just go along with it. Ajahn Brahm after lunch today, we're talking about slightly silly things, kind of funny, all the things we used to get up to. And at some point he just said, okay, that's enough. Conversation's going downhill. And that was the end of it. <laughs> He doesn't need much, <laughs> but he also enjoys it to a point. But it's quite good, isn't it, to have somebody there that will say, OK, I think that's probably enough for now. <laughs> OK, 
how to deal with people who have become convinced of conspiracy theories and get upset if you disagree. Yeah, I don't know. This is a very strange phenomenon, isn't it? Very, very strange. I guess it's um, about trying to get in contact with their emotional state and maybe develop some compassion and resonance with that. Maybe they have fear at that moment. Maybe what they're saying isn't really as important as you know how they actually feel. I would imagine that they might be feeling agitated. They might be feeling duped or betrayed or you know afraid doubtful what to believe confused etc and maybe if we can just stay present to that rather than try and you know argue with them because it's obviously not anything rational and i'm not only saying people convinced of that are not rational none of us are 100 percent rational um none of us really know i mean there's many many ways of looking at things and um Although I'm not buying into most conspiracy theories, I guess my mom might think I do because I'm not 100% convinced of allopathic medicine, having studied Ayurveda, um, you know, and she might think that's a bit strange. So, yeah, usually I think try not to disagree too much, try and say, oh, it's interesting that you think that way. I think another way, but, um, you know, I'm here to hear you anyway. And um, is there anything I can do to make you a cup of tea or just be a friend. But also it might be that, you know, you don't have to hang out with people for too long, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, okay, I'm, you know, I've had enough now. I want to go back and have some quiet time to myself. Um, sometimes we think we have to kind of hang out with whoever's around us. And actually the Buddhist path talks about the importance of wise friends. So it's not necessarily cruel to disengage. Sometimes it can be an act of compassion to both. Um, and I would say it's important to be discerning in who you hang around with and for how long. Yeah, but if you find you're getting upset and angry and irritated, it's definitely time to change the subject <laughs> or walk away. Okay, I'll try and do the next two. And then uh, I think, well, this is all I can see. So that should be enough so that you can have your last afternoon of peace and quiet. Okay, a couple of years ago, I put my main focus on right speech. First, I was shocked at how sloppy my speech was. Secondly, I was amazed at how much my whole practice and meditation improved with this commitment. Amazing, wonderful. That's wonderful. Good for you. That's really wonderful, yes. So encouraging for us all. These teachings have been so insightful and I'm learning so much in my early journey and help bringing the Dhamma into daily life, especially. Yay! I love the approach of gentle loving kindness and the peace and metta that has come from this retreat. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. That's very lovely. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, if you can leave from this retreat feeling that little bit more kindness, peace, and feeling like you have a few tools for your daily life and this commitment to really, you know, applying Dhamma, then this is a massive, massive uh, accomplishment, you could say. It's, it's a growth in wisdom. It's a growth in wisdom. As I say, you know, it doesn't so much matter what experiences you have or don't have. It's about how we apply it in the life and how that transforms our whole conduct, you know, of body, speech and mind. And that's a gradual thing. So well done and celebrate this please and for everybody here you know just celebrate the fact that you've been here with us for seven days it's not over yet there's still lots and lots more lovely uh, connecting and learning to do together and um be encouraged you know because most people never even hear these teachings so however much you have gained, this is enormous and it's going to take you on in many um to have a beneficial life in this life, but also future lives. I'm very convinced of that. So with that positive note, let's end today's Sutta discussion. And we shall see you in the evening. And maybe before you go, as most of you are here, um, just to say a couple of words about tomorrow, in case we forget later on, that um, we'll still be meeting in the morning at 8 and having a slightly shorter talk and meditation with Ajahn Brown. And after that, um, I think at about quarter to 10 until 11, we'll have a kind of closing session. So there'll be another opportunity for a few questions, but there'll also be an opportunity for you to meet together in small groups, maybe four or five people, and just 
share a little bit together, whatever you feel inclined to share. And um, at the very end, I'll do a little blessing. Maybe we'll do five or 10 minutes of uh, loving kindness or forgiveness, something very simple just to close. Okay, so there'll be more meta practice and there'll be a little bit more connecting tomorrow as well. So we'll see you later for our last silent meditation at half past six and then a Q&A session as well. Take care, everybody. Thank you for being so committed to the Dhamma. I love this. Sadu, sadu, sadu.